Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning Ricky. Got to get live here. Good morning. Well, glad you're here. I would like to dovetail this uh, sermon with John's sermon last week, the, cur the Pearl of Great Price. And most of the time when we talk about the Pearl of Great Price, we look at it as what we would think that our Pearl of Great Price is. But after this uh, study that I've done, that I'm going to deliver to you today, that I hope to deliver to you today, the Pearl of Great Price is us, and we are God's reward. And it's an incredible story, and, and I've heard it said that Satan began this great controversy, but God is going to step in and end it. But between this great controversy that Satan started and God ending it, there's a lot of uh, living between there. And this is what God has, He has uh, stepped in. And you know, let's just get started. Uh, this quote is in the uh, is in your uh, bulletin today, and it comes from uh, the, the Six Testimonies, page two thirty six point one, and it's highlighted <coughs> the part that I'm going to read. The law that none liveth to himself, Satan determined to oppose. He desired to live for self. It was this that incited rebellion in heaven, and it was man's acceptance of this principle that brought sin on the earth. Where did the principle of selfishness come from? We, it, Satan, it came from Satan. The principle of self selfishness is uh, is something that that Satan brought to us, and it is the third the, the third angel's message that will bring this to a climax. Unfortunately, that same mentality was brought here on this earth after Satan accepted or after Satan. Uh, became proud and he thought that he was better than God so we want to deal with this topic today God does not just sit on his hands and when Adam and Eve fell the things there are times when it feels like he's not doing anything I mean, does it feel like that to you in your life? It, it just feels like God's not doing anything. But God didn't start this as I started my sermon off with. And, but He's going to end it. But we have to live there in the meantime. And so God's not just sitting idly by on His hands. He, he's not waiting for time to elapse. He wants to come in and he wants to do something. God is active through this entire portion of the great controversy between Satan sinning and the end of the controversy. Amen. God is not passive. He wants to deal with us today and every day. Our view of God is what Satan is attacking. He, Satan wants to distort our view of God so that it, it, we won't see God the way He is and how much He does love us. God is... When we look at the Bible, we find where God loves us and He's trying to reach us. The worldview says that the God in the Old Testament is a God of fire and vengeance. And the God of the New Testament, Jesus, is, is, it says the lovely, peaceable Jesus in the New Testament. But when we look at the Old Testament scriptures, and we find, and we figure out, and we see that God
God, the, the God of the Old Testament, is the God of the New Testament. How much He loves us and He cares for us. Amen. Now, if we look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, and I'm reading from the New English translation, it says, Do I actually delight in the death of the wicked? declares the Sovereign Lord, do I not prefer that he turn from his wicked conduct and live? In Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but prefer that the wicked change his behavior and live and turn back and turn back from his evil deeds. Why should you die, O house of Israel? And in 2 Peter uh, 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow concerning His promises. Some regard slowness, but is being patient towards you because He does not wish for any to perish, for all to come to repentance. It is clear that God does not delight in putting an end to sin by destroying sinners. But to put an end to sin, there is going to be some collateral damage. And God, He does, He, is, how does, God has a predicament. How does He destroy the sin that He hates and protect the sinners that He loves? Mm-hmm. It's not like, you know, we have some bugs and let's just get rid of the bugs. He said, but who refused to respond to the faith of Jesus? These are people that God created in His image. Just think about that. God created us in His image. And if you create something in love, it just doesn't make sense that you would want to destroy that. We belong to God, and He wants to see us in His kingdom. Now, it does say in Scripture that God will have to destroy those that will not respond to His grace. And that is called, it's called a strange act. Now, God does not, He does, as, we, as the Scripture verse has already read, He does not rejoice in the death of anyone. No one creates, and I said this before, no one creates something out of love and takes enjoyment in destroying it. It doesn't make any sense. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, and I'm, I'm just going to read part of this. It says, and I'm reading from the New English Translation. I can't say that's my favorite translation, but it's the most readable for the English language. And I like that part about the New English translation. It says, I will sing to my love, this is verse 1, a song to my lover about his vineyard. My love had a vineyard on a fertile hill. And this is God speaking about his people, Israel. He built a hedge around it, removed its stone, and planted a vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and constructed a wine press. He waited for it to produce edible grapes, but it produced sour ones instead. So now, residents of Jerusalem, people of Judah, you decide between me and my vineyard. What more can I do for my vineyard beyond what I've already done? I mean, if you look at Israel and, and how they spurn God's love for them, and He gave them everything. There was nothing that He wouldn't have given them that they needed. God is pleading with His people. And, and, and we're His people. He's done everything possible for them. They could, produce, they could have produced a beautiful harvest. But of course they did not. And... It says what he comes to find is that they are putting out poisonous fruit. After a time, they are given what they want. After a time, God gives up. And he lets us have what we want. And, if you, and faith and works, it says when God lets man have his own way, 
It's the darkest hour of his life. If we, we read in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and uh, this verse always kind of puzzled me a little bit until I studied for this uh, sermon that I'm doing today. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, if you, you know that the first word that's mentioned is ungodliness. Now, when you see that, when, when you become ungodliness, you have to be ungodly before you can become unrighteous. And that's the order that it's written. It says, and the right who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, and I like this, his invisible attributes are, what does it say, clearly seen. His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, are we have no excuse. It says, I, it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, for nor were they thankful, but were futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four footed and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among them, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So God gave them up. It says, when God lets man have his own way, he is the darkest hour of his life. I can't imagine if God came to me and said, okay, I'm going to let you run things right now, I would just mess it up. There is no way that, that God, get, God gives them what they want. So that this means that if He gives them what they want, then they have to provide their own protection. Huh. It says, when we provide our own protection, guess what? You have to reap the consequences of your own life. When we're not trusting God. <laughs> now someone says, but God should have kept this from happening. Look at all the, the crazy stuff that happens in our world. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and listen. You can go home and, if you don't, if you're not familiar, you go home and look at your newspaper if you get one, or borrow your neighbors. He says, why doesn't God do something? Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, not, not Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And I'm reading again from the New English translation. It says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the orchard, or the vineyard, in Eden, to care for it and to maintain it. Then the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat from every tree of the orchard, I mean, that's, that's a lot. He says, every tree. What if God just said, well, you can eat of that tree over there. You leave the rest of them alone. That would have been kind of, eh. But he did. He said, I love you so much. I made all these trees for you. And you can eat from all of them. But there's one tree I want you to stay away from. He says, you may free eat, eat from every tree, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why in the world would we want to do such? Why? I have no idea. I'm not in Adam's shoes. And I'm glad I didn't have to make the decision because I probably would have chose the same way Adam chose. It says, for when you eat from it, you, I will kill you. From when, when you eat from that tree, I will kill you. Is that what God says? Well, you will surely die. Why God is, no, He didn't say He was going to kill it. He says, if you eat from that tree, there's going to be consequences. God, in His great mercy, gave Adam a clear warning. 
it, before it happened even. He says, don't do it or you're going to suffer the consequences. Before he did it, God is protecting us. He's, he's here with us now. And he's saying, whatever you have here, let's go to uh, chapter 4. And look what he does in chapter 4 of Genesis. God is, he loves us too much to, to let us go our own way. It says, now, this is the, and in the New English translation, and if I'm not reading, I'm going to quit saying that. When I, if I'm not reading from the New English translation, I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> now the man had marital relations with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And then she said, I have created a man just as the Lord did. Then she gave birth to another, brother, to his brother Abel. Abel took care of the flocks while Cain cultivated the ground. At the designated time, Cain brought some fruit of the ground for an offering to the Lord. There's so much we can say about that. You know, it's said at this day and time that there's two groups of people. One group goes with Cain and the other group goes with Abel. The, the ones that, the group in Abel, they gave what God prescribed. He prescribed, he prescribed, he wanted, what did he want? He wanted a blood sacrifice. And Cain decided to go his own way, which that's the way we are today. We, we want to go our own way. God, this is, this is my best I can do. But is that what God asked for? No. And the Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering was not, he was not pleased. So Cain became very, very angry. And his expression was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? This is God before. He says, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your expression downcast? Is it not true that, that if you do what is right, you will be fine? But if you do what is wrong, sin is crouching at the door and it desires to dominate you. But you must subdue it. What does Cain do? I mean, y'all read the story. What does he do? He kills his brother. And God, in advance, he said, God is telling Cain, I know what's going through your mind right now. Did God know what was going through Cain's mind? Yes. Does, does God know what's going through your mind? Yes. <laughs> and he's telling Cain, you don't have to do this. He says, there's another way. I mean, God condescends. He comes down from heaven and speaks personally to Cain. I don't want to do this. And what does Cain do? He does it. He kills his brother. But not at not before God comes and warns him. And brothers and sisters, we're the same way. God is speaking to our hearts. God is giving us a voice of reason before we sin. Not a, vo not, a, uh, not a voice of condemna condemnation after we sin. That voice of condemnation after we sin, who is that? Yeah. The accuser. The accuser. He says, God says, I love you. I don't want you to fall. I take no delight in the destruction of the wicked. Is what our scripture verse was. But when God lets man have his own way, it leads to darkness in his life. The darkest hour of his life is when God gives us our own way. And it's proven in the garden, before sin even, God gave Adam and Eve their own way, and what did they do? There's a dark cloud that has come over planet Earth because we have bought into Satan's lies about what God, who God is and what and the picture of God. We have bought into those lies. Look at this planet. It is, this is the end of sin. Look at the destruction. There's parts 
and, and maybe not New Smyrna Beach, because New Smyrna Beach has changed through the years since I've lived here. You walk down through Daytona Beach in some of the, those areas, you won't, you won't come out. Our world was not designed to be this way. So this dark cloud that's over the, our planet, because we have bought into Satan's lies, God says, I am not withholding good from you. I am protecting you from evil. I'm protecting you from the circumstances or the uh, repercussions. Will you respond to God's voice? The first two sins recorded on, in Scripture is not because God didn't do enough. He was trying. God is not passive. They came even though God was active. <coughs> there was never a time when man had to be separated from God eternally. Nobody has been separated from Him eternally yet. But there is going to come that day. As soon as God preaches the gospel, He tells us, He's the, he talks about Jesus, the gospel. The lamb is slain from when? From Jesus. Yeah, we're good at it to start with. This is what he communicates to us. You know, and I hear people say, well, God is not fair. Now, can you show me where God is not fair in, in, in these first two sins we're talking about with Adam and Eve and then Cain? God warned them in advance. He could have killed them. But why did he, why did he, why does God do this? What license does God have to do what he's doing? God is, is pursuing us at every step. The license that God has to do what he's doing is love, agape love. There is a, that's the only reason God is, is doing it. That's why we're here today. There's no reason for the human race. No reason whatsoever. You know, unless you're, if you're an evolutionist, you might be able to, to lie to yourself and say, well, we came from them. But there's no reason for the human race. Now, if we're, if, if, when we're dealing with unbelievers, and you show them that God is, didn't just wind this thing up and walk away, that He's active in everything, that they're more easily, I believe we can convince believers, unbelievers, of God if we can just tell them the story of Cain and Abel and how God tried to prevent it. And if you look through Scripture, uh, Isaiah chapter 5. Actually, I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 27 first. I will sprinkle you with pure water, and you will be clean from all your impurities. I will purify you from your idols. And this is what God's doing for us. I will purify you from your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your body and give